A very detailed NTSB preliminary report is out on the American Airlines 737-800 that had that chaotic evacuation in Denver just back last March that ended up with a bunch of passengers out here on the wing of the 737 with no way to get down because both engines were shut off at the gate, the hydraulics were off, and so there was no way to lower the flaps quickly before the passengers got out there in an uncommanded evacuation. And to me, at the end of this investigation, it's going to sound a little bit like the little old lady who swallowed the fly story as we connect all the tiny little holes in the Swiss cheese that led to this chaotic evacuation and engine fire. Let's check it out and get a deep dive into how these engines work. Now I say uncommanded evacuation because the crew did not command this evacuation. The crew, unfortunately, was the last people to know that this engine was in fact on fire because the engines were already shut down at the gate and the wind was blowing the smoke back away from the cockpit so there was no engine indications uh, in, in the cockpit that there was a fire. There was only the smoke and fumes filling up the back of the airplane that prompted the uncommanded evacuation. And as part of the evacuation checklist on the 737, one of the things you want to do before you give the evacuation command is lower the flaps so that the passengers have a place to get out of the aircraft because the 737 does not have overwing slides like you might see on bigger aircraft. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And this video is brought to you by viewers like you who support this channel here on Patreon. Thank you for your support. So this incident occurred back on March 13, 1759 local time. There were 178 total souls on board. This incident resulted in 12 minor injuries. The FO was the pilot flying and the captain was the pilot monitoring. According to the flight crew during takeoff, just before V1, there was an EGT overtemp for the number two engine. Tight spot there. Captain, what are you going to do? <laughs> just prior to V1 rotate, you get this slightly high temperature, they continued to press on. And after gear and flaps were retracted, the power was slightly reduced on the number two engine, and the EGT over temp subsided within limits. And that's what you can do with EGTs, is just bring the throttle back a little bit and bring it back within limits. During climb out, the captain noted high engine vibration indications on the right engine, and the captain called for the high engine vibration checklist, and the FO continued to fly the aircraft. The engine vibration checklist simply has you retard the throttle on the affected engine until you get the vibration within limits below four units. And so you can continue to operate the engine at that reduced power setting. The flight crew then discussed the need to divert and contact a dispatch and they decided that Denver would be the most reasonable airport and they climbed up to 16,000 feet and headed over to Denver. The captain informed the passengers and flight attendants about the diversion. The approach and landing were normal, and it took about five minutes to taxi to the gate. Soon after arriving at the gate, flight attendants heard passengers yelling fire and smoke and saw smoke start to fill the cabin. One of the flight attendants tried calling the flight crew but did not get an answer. Another flight attendant knocked on the cabin door to alert the flight crew that there was a fire outside the airplane and smoke in the cabin. Again, the flight crew was the last to know about this. In the meantime, passengers got up and were coming up to the flight attendants wanting to get off the airplane. The flight attendants continued their assessments and then initiated an evacuation. And, and that's what we call an uncommanded evacuation. It's not commanded by the flight crew, so the flight crew doesn't get a chance to run their evacuation checklist before folks start sliding out of the airplane. So with the fire on the right side of the airplane, passengers used the L1 door, both left over wing exits, and the right number two door for egress. So that's the right door all the way towards the back of the airplane. The passengers who used the one left, the one left door, by the way, I assume was already hooked up to the jet bridge. Yeah, the one left door deplaned using the jet bridge. If I would just read ahead, <laughs> the jetway bridge. After the evacuation, the L2 door, that's the left side door towards the back of the aircraft, was observed cracked open with maintenance subsequently discovering the escape slide jammed in the door preventing its operation. So that explains why we didn't see anybody coming out of the rear door on the left side of the airplane. The right number two door evacuation slide deployed automatically when the right number two door opened. That's this door right here. This is well after the fact and the doors are buttoned back up, these pictures. 
The passengers who used the left over wing window exits were evacuated off the wing by a combination of ground vehicles, ladders, and you saw that on the news, uh, that were available at the gate area and a belt loader. Post-event examination found the flaps had remained at zero. So they got some pretty good post-crash fire damage to the airframe, and I'd say that aluminum in that area of the fuselage is literally toast. On the right engine nacelle, they found these black streak marks indicating there was some sort of problem with the engine while it was still in flight, and then, of course, the big black soot marks from the fire after it was on the ground. And earlier in the report, it talks about one of the cameras on the ground noting fluid leaking out of the right engine as it was taxiing back to the gate. So what caused this right engine to catch fire? And this is where we're going to go a deep dive into how these engines work. Because they found a lot of little things wrong here. The uh, the 737s, of course, powered by the CFM-56 engines. And the right engine was examined and all the engine fan blades were present. But one fan blade platform was fractured. Okay, more on that in a minute. In addition, the lock wire of a fuel fitting on the variable stator vane was loose and installed in the incorrect direction. I'll explain that in a minute. The variable stator vane actuator rod end was incorrectly fastened and secured to the VSV actuator, allowing fuel to leak from the fitting. So there's where they got the fuel for the fire. The variable stator vane rod end muscle line was fractured in the weld and the six o'clock sealed drain line of the inboard thrust reverser half was blocked with sealant above the lower bifurcation fire seal and in the exit tube. So this explains uh, the fuel or the source of the fire was this fuel leaking from the variable stator vane valve and then the fuel was not draining properly out of the engine because the drain was plugged and so they had a, a post-engine shutdown fire contained with inside the cowling of the aircraft. Now they found the L2 slide, that's the left rear slide that didn't work, was found removed from its bustle on the floor of the L2 passageway with its safety pin installed and the slide pack was inspected with the bannis latch was found to move freely. There were some dark scuffs on the outboard side of the pack and there was a tear on the underside of the girt fabric toward the center. So some of you door slide experts, can you tell me what's going on here? Did uh, somebody do something wrong with this with this slide that got in this condition or was this a pre was this indicating some kind of a problem with the slide um, that would have prevented it from deploying correctly? So they got good FDR flight data recorder information 54 hours worth with over a thousand parameters recorded. but the crummy cockpit voice recorder once again failed us. The cockpit area microphone channel of the CVR recorded an hour of audio prior to this time. However, audio from the cockpit area monitor was unintelligible for the full duration of the recording. Okay, let's get into it in detail. What was it that caused the engine vibration? And it sounds like they're looking at the one fan blade platform that was fractured. What is that? There's a neat old video out here on YouTube about a teardown of a CFM 56 engine, the fan blade section here. And the platform is this piece located right here. Stand by while I increase the size of my mouse. There, can you see me now? So here's the fan blades mounted into the hub and the platform is this piece in between the individual fan blades, which helps aerodynamically smooth the design of the air going through the fan section and help lock the blades in place and keep them from rattling around so much. Agent Jay-Z, if you can add anything to this in the comment section and make sure I'm getting this right. So in order to remove the blades, first you gotta lubricate them all up, get them all nicely loosened up, and then remove the platform first, this bit in between the blades. Install puller 856A3779 on the platform to be removed. Now check this bit of ink body English it takes to get this first one out of here. Lift the rear of the blade root into the slot of the booster spool forward flange. While you keep the rear of the blade root lifted with your hand, push the second blade with your elbow. <laughs> so you're working with two blades at the same time and there it is, the platform popped right out of there. 
So that was the, the component the that was fractured, the presumably causing the engine vibration. Once you get the platforms removed on each side of the blade, you can begin removing the individual blades. They just slide out of the hub. Okay, now up next, in addition, the lock wire of a fuel fitting on the variable stator vane was loose and installed in the incorrect direction. This is basic safety wire 101. So first off, what the heck is a variable stator vane and actuator? Check out this neat little video here on Facebook. So through the fuel control unit, as you demand more throttle or thrust out of the engine, you throw those throttles forward, you need to open up the airflow through the engine. So the first four sections of the high pressure compressor section have variable stator vanes, which open like this to allow more airflow into the engine as you demand more power out of the engine. So here's a neat cutaway view animation of the CFM56 engine. Starting from the left, here's your fan, and then there's 12 stages of compression, the low pressure stage and the high pressure stage. And here's the one, two, three, four, the first four stages of the high pressure section, which have these variable stator veins. See these pins located on here? Stator, stationary, these veins don't move. Let me roll the animation here. There, there's the rolling compressor blades or the turning compressor blades and then the stationary ones that you can adjust with the variable stator vein system. So this is the stator vein actuator with the actuator rod end shown here which is powered by high pressure fuel and then this actuator runs all this monkey motion here which adjusts the variable stator veins around the engine. And it was problems with this that they found on this component that caused the fuel leak. Specifically, they mentioned that the variable stator vane actuator rod end was incorrectly fastened and secured to the variable stator vane actuator, allowing fuel to leak from the fitting. And also this issue about lock wire. Safety wire 101, righty tighty lefty loosey, the right hand rule of thumb, remember? <laughs> As an A&P student, the first thing I learned is your thumb is the bolt and your fingertips are the direction that the safety wire or the bolt has to go to get tight. And you always got to safety wire your bolts so that you safety wire them in the righty tighty condition, right? So here's this bolt safety wired around to the right. And then this safety wire has to wrap around the other bolt in the righty tighty condition as well like that. If you were to wrap this wire around this way and send it through this way, you're tending to loosen up the bolt. So the safety wire always has to be done in the correct direction and it needs to be kept tight around the fastener as well. And here's the trick to doing that. One big loop with the safety wire pliers to get that last bit tightened up around the fastener to create nice, crisp, clean safety wire. Connections. Maybe it's better for the camera if I hold my hand this way. Bolt goes in like that. Righty tighty. Same thing with the safety wire. It's got to go that way. Got it? So through a series of tiny little unfortunate events, a flight crew finds itself on the national news with this rather chaotic evacuation on top of the wing of a 737. And it just shows you the level of detail that is required to safely operate and maintain these precision machines every day for millions of hours of flying time. Thank you so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.